The International Association for the Study of Pain recently released their revised definition of pain, and this was really the first time they've done this in about 40 years. And what the revised definition of pain is, is it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And with that, they have a couple of notes kind of clarifying some points, but that is the definition of pain in their most concise wordage that they could use. But let's dive into some of the other notes because I think it helps to actually figure out what pain is, and it also gives us some glimpses in what clinically we should be doing to help those with either acute or persistent pain. And the first note that they have under the revised definition of pain is that pain is a personal experience and it's contributed to varying degrees of biological, psychological, and social factors. And the revision from the previous definition was that pain is a subjective experience. And the reason why they did this is because when you say that pain is a subjective experience, it's kind of up for debate because you it's not objective. You can't prove that somebody's in pain. Whereas if you say that it's a personal experience, well, if somebody says that they're experiencing pain, it's not up for debate. It should be accepted as that person is experiencing pain. And when we look at the latter part of that definition of the varying degrees of contributions from biological, psychological, and social factors, that's not necessarily new. We know that pain is multifactorial. There's biological, psychological, and social factors that can contribute to pain, but I like that they actually mentioned that varying degrees. So if somebody has an ankle sprain, it might be more of that biological contribution where we had tissue damage and so that's what's driving the pain experience. Whereas if somebody's dealing with maybe some chronic pain, those psychological and social factors might be driving the pain syndrome a little bit more. So I like that it's varying degrees because you know, whenever somebody is experiencing pain, not all of them are going to contribute equally. And so it's good that they mention that, that in this note. The second note that they included in the revised definition of pain is that pain and nociception are not synonymous and that you can't infer if someone is experiencing pain solely based on the activity of a sensory neuron. So that nociception. And so kind of going into a broad context, nociception is basically when a nociceptor in the body is triggered and there's various different noxious stimuli that the nociceptor can respond to. It could be mechanical, it could be temperature, or it could be chemical. And so when the nociceptor is stimulated, it generates a signal and goes to the brain. And this has been a pretty big emphasis in the pain science community in that that generation of nociception is not sufficient enough to actually generate pain. It's not a, well, if you have nociception, therefore you have pain. And this is important because generally when we think about the production of pain, we think about it in this context, in that if there's disruption in the tissue, so there's a mechanical tearing of a ligament, let's say you roll your ankle, that there's a disruption in the mechanical uh, nociceptor that leads to nociception and therefore you have pain with an ankle sprain. Or maybe we look at a different example of we put our hand on the stove, the thermo nociceptors get activated, it generates nociception and therefore you have pain. But that's not necessarily the case is what this note is saying in that you can have nociception and you don't necessarily have to experience pain or you can also look at it from, well, you can have no nociception, but still have pain. And so I think this is a very important note when it comes to actually understanding pain as a whole. The third note that they included in this revised definition of pain is that through their life experiences, people learn the concept of pain. And I think this is another really important topic because when we look at like cultural differences, there are, there, are, there are differences when we look at how people express pain, and those are typically learned through their culture. And that's something that we need to be aware of when we're interacting with people coming in with some sort of pain syndrome. And the problem is, is that 
we as providers, we obviously can't experience what somebody is experiencing when they come in with pain. We kind of filter it through our own lens, but it's important to know that the context of how these people um, live their lives will influence how they actually interpret and experience pain. So just being aware of that can help us when we're actually trying to problem solve to help people with some sort of pain. And that previous note that pain is learned through life experiences kind of blends into the next note, which is that if somebody's reporting that they're experiencing pain, we should accept that they are experiencing pain. And there's a variety of different paths that we can take when discussing this. And I think one of them is just going back to that original example of cultural differences in that culture has a lot to do with how people express pain and also how they process pain. And so as a provider, it can be difficult to understand that just because we obviously filter information through our own lens, but that doesn't mean that the pain that somebody is reporting that they're experiencing isn't real just because it doesn't seem to jive with whatever our, we think pain should be. So for example, if we look at an ankle sprain or something like that, and somebody's complaining that their ankle is, uh, that they're experiencing pain in their ankle, well, sometimes it can be dismissive because the mechanism of injury just doesn't seem to match with whatever pain they're experiencing. Well, there's no swelling, they're not limping, and it kind of goes, well, they're, they're faking it, it's not real. And that's not to say people aren't faking that they're experiencing pain. I'm sure there are some people, but we shouldn't be so dismissive of that because some people are actually going to be having more pain because pain, like one of the other notes, pain is not equal to nociception. And so there's other drivers of pain besides just purely nociception and tissue damage. So we need to really be aware of this when we're actually working with people and that it's not just purely that they're making it up or exaggerating. They can actually be experiencing pain and severe pain with what might seem trivial to some providers in their mechanism of injury, but that doesn't mean that they're not experiencing their pain syndrome. And unfortunately, part of this can actually be just that the provider isn't up to date with the most current pain science, in that they look at it purely from that nociceptive model, in that if there's not tissue damage and there's not disruption mechanically of the structures, well, there's no way that they can be experiencing pain, but when we look at the pain science research, it's pretty clear that we don't have to have a tissue-based source to actually experience pain. So we don't need nociception necessarily. There's other different avenues or paths that can be producers of pain. So as providers, we just need to be aware that there are multiple factors that can actually contribute to the production and experience of pain. And the fifth note that they include in this revised definition of pain is that although pain is usually serving an adaptive role, it actually might have adverse effects in function, social, or psychological well-being. And this statement generally refers more to chronic pain, but can definitely be applied to more acute pain cases as well. And I think this is actually a really important note. I know I've said that for the rest of them, but to me, this one highlights the need to actually work together with other disciplines. And so when we look at musculoskeletal conditions, generally the focus is a lot on the biological aspects. Um, so the structures that are included, if we're looking at low back pain, it's the intervertebral disc, it's facet syndrome, it's loading, it's biomechanics of how you actually move. But when we look at some of the research, there seems to be some sort of association with anxiety and depression, and those are clearly psychological factors. And so as a musculoskeletal provider, I'm not well versed in interventions to help with psychological or social fa um, factors, but that's where we have clinical psychologists, that's where we have social workers to really kind of help tackle some of those aspects of pain that are contributing that aren't biological in nature. And so. To me, that's really the important part of this note is that we need to take a look at the person as a whole who's experiencing pain and then trying to figure out, well, which barriers or what factors are creating the most barriers for this person and then what is the best treatment strategy to help them overcome those barriers.
And the final note that they included in this revised definition of pain is that verbal description is only one of the many ways that someone can communicate whether they're in pain or not. And this is interesting because when we look at this definition of pain, it was not only meant just for humans, it was also for non-humans, so animals as well. And it's interesting because it's not something that I really thought about until I actually read this. And to me, it reminds me of a lot of Schrodinger's cat in that if we have that box, the person can be in pain and not in pain at the same time until somebody asks if they're in pain or not. And they say, yes, I'm in pain and it's located here. But when we ask people if they're experiencing pain a lot in the clinic, we get a lot of different answers. It's not always yes. It's, it's just really tight up and through here or there's a trigger point or a knot, but they're kind of wiggling around saying whether it's pain or not. And by definition, it's an unpleasant sensation it's pain, it might just be low in intensity, but it's still under that umbrella of pain. And so this is just an interesting note because it's not something that I really thought about, but ex verbal expression is just one way to communicate it. There's other ways that pain is expressed, which we should be aware of as well. Thank you for watching this episode on the revised definition of pain. I hope I didn't bore you that much. I hope you actually found this information useful. If you did, go ahead and give this video a big thumbs up. If you want to see more of my content, hit the subscribe button down below. And if you want to be notified of future videos, hit the bell icon as well. I'll see you guys in the next video.